Welcome to the Psych Central Podcast, where each episode features guest experts discussing psychology and mental health in everyday, plain language. Here's your host, Gabe Howard. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Psych Central Podcast. Today, I will be talking to Rachel Grant. She's the owner and founder of Rachel Grant Coaching and is a sexual abuse recovery coach. She is also the author of Beyond Surviving, The Final Stage in Recovery from Sexual Abuse. She works with survivors of childhood sexual abuse who are beyond sick and tired of feeling broken, unfixable, and burdened by the past. Rachel, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Gabe. It's nice to be here with you. Well, I really appreciate you being here. The first question that I want to ask you is, I think that sexual abuse is one of those things that everybody thinks that they understand. But I suspect that in reality, there's probably a lot of nuance and a lot of information that maybe the public is missing. Can you kind of fill us in on that and maybe talk a little about it so we understand exactly what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the show? Yes. So for our purposes today and for the work that I do, childhood sexual abuse is generally defined as any act towards a person who cannot consent or refuse based on their age, their circumstances, their level of dependence, perhaps fear or manipulation. And so any act that can fall into that category, anything from being tickled and to the point where you're saying no and you're still being tickled and you're, you know, your body space is being violated in that way all the way through child rape. All of these things constitute childhood sexual abuse and um, are the types of experiences that I myself have had, of course, and then that I work with my clients through every day. There's a phrase that that always kind of uh, sticks in my mind when I listen to sexual abuse recovery survivors, whether childhood or otherwise, and and the, the phrase is specifically a fate worse than death. Mm. That kind of strikes me as a little bit odd, but... You know, I, I've come to understand, uh, again, what it means. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because I know that this is a very uncomfortable subject, but of course it, it needs to be better understood so that people can get the help that they need. Yeah, for sure. The experience of childhood sexual trauma, I don't know that it's necessarily a fate worse than death, <laughs> but, uh, but what I will say is that you know, as somebody who experienced childhood sexual trauma, my grandfather began abusing me when I was 10 years old. It's likely that he was abusing me before that, but my most conscious memories start at the age of 10. So that's just where I mark it. There's an immediate rupture of self that happens when sexual abuse is occurring. And so what I often describe it as is you have this sense of self. You have this person who you are, and the trauma creates a disconnection and a separation from that self. And then what happens is over time, all of these layers of abuse and trauma and the beliefs that you have as a result of that experience get layered on top of who you really are. And so this process is fatal in the sense that you become so separated and disconnected. And if we do not have a reintegration of self, if we don't have a healing of the nervous system and of the brain and of the spirit, when then, you know, you can kind of end up walking through life as a ghost of yourself. And that's tragic. And this is a real epidemic in our world. And so talking about it is so key, Gabe, because without conversation, without bringing these things into the light, we can't really get into the process of creating systems and structures and policies that really will fully address what's going on here in our, in our world, in our family, and for the young people, children, you know, today who are being abused. So we want to try to prevent the next generation as much as we possibly can. And I know that a lot of... Uh childhood sexual abuse survivors, they start off on a place of blaming themselves. They think it's their fault, which makes them not great at advocating for themselves because they sort of feel like it's their problem to deal with when it's anything but. Am am I speaking truth or am I misunderstanding? Oh yeah, for sure. When you are a child and you are dependent upon the adults around you, the lesson that most children are taught is listen to the adults, right? They know what's going on. They know what's up. (laughs) Trust them. Follow their lead. Follow their guide. And a lot of times that's to the benefit of the child, right? right? If you have good mentorship, if you have good guardianship, you have someone who is 
really trying to light the way for you as you're trying to figure out this whole crazy thing called life. But when an abuser uses that child's innocence and trust, to create a circumstance in which abuse happens, the child is completely faced with something that is discordant. So you have, on one hand, these messages that you've been given that you're, the adults in your life care about you, trust them, they want the best for you. But your internal experience is one of fear and lack of safety and confusion. And so one of the things that we all do as human beings is we try to understand why we're having the experiences that we have. And so if you put a little person in that kind of environment and leave them to their own devices to try to understand why is this happening to me, then the egocentric mind of the child, which just basically means, you know, children focus on themselves, right? They're not very altruistic yet. Right, (laughs) right. We're young. Normal. That's part of, you know, healthy, normal human development. The trap of that for children who are experiencing trauma is that they turn everything internal. And so it becomes, what am I doing? What's wrong with me? What am I doing that's causing this? What is there about me that's making this person hurt me in this way? The other reason why that happens, Gabe, is because it's protective for the psyche. If you're a child, you're dependent upon the adults around you for your safety. And by the way, I'm speaking in this context because the majority of abuse happens within the context of family. It's actually a very small percentage of abuse and trauma that happens outside of that context. So you're living within this family system, you're dependent upon the adults for your food, your shelter, your clothes, like these sorts of things. So to then mentally make the switch to labeling that person as someone who's harmful, someone who's dangerous, psychologically, that is that would be detrimental to a child to do that. Because you're basically, your only out at that point is I better get out of here. And how can you do that? You can't. So psychologically, we turn this back on ourselves because it feels safer. The other just thing I'll name in this moment of talking about the whole it's my fault, this is like one of the top three beliefs that survivors of trauma are kind of conditioned into and find themselves dealing with. One of my mentors says, you know, when we are experiencing trauma, we hold on to the hope that this person will somehow change. They will become that loving nurturing adult that we possibly know them as in other contexts or knew them as for a very long time. And then there was this change. And so we hold on to the hope that that will come back. And if we label this person as bad and wrong and harmful, we have to give up that hope. And that, again, is detrimental to a child's psychology. So we hold on to that blame. And this is certainly one of the things that I had to work so very deeply on, Gabe, you know, in my own healing journey. It was quite the mountain to climb. And of course, with all of my clients now, there's a a full process within my program where we look at all the different aspects that add up to the idea of it's my fault, and then we break it all down and we dismantle that belief so we can come into the realization that we are not at fault. There isn't anything about who we are or what we did or what we didn't do that caused the abuse to happen. We're going to step away to hear from our sponsor and we'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. Secure, convenient, and affordable online counseling. All counselors are licensed, accredited professionals. Anything you share is confidential. Schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist whenever you feel it's needed. A month of online therapy often costs less than a single traditional face-to-face session. Go to BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central and experience seven days of free therapy to see if online counseling is right for you. BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central. We're back talking to Rachel Grant, author of Beyond Surviving, The Final Stage in Recovery from Sexual Abuse. It sort of strikes me that that some of the most traumatizing things that, that can happen in this space are things that happen because it feels so normal in an abnormal situation. And, and mm. does, does that make sense? Because I, I can see how this is just nothing that people are prepared to deal yeah. with both as the victim and, of course, as the, the parents or caregivers. Yeah, we've got a lot of dynamics happening here. So first of all, we have to take into account what's called generational trauma. So if the caregivers have themselves experienced trauma and abuse and haven't received support, sometimes even if they have, when faced with the trauma of their child, 
they just kind of go right back into that blank space of like, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to look at this. I can't handle this. And so it's like hitting an escape button and rationalizing or denying it is the easiest escape button there is. So their own trauma can often inform and influence their reactions. This is not to excuse those choices and those behaviors. There are layers that are happening here. You have families where, you know, maybe mom is extremely dependent upon the abuser or vice versa. And so when faced with this, you know, moment, there are all these very layered considerations that the person is working through. What's going to happen? Can I support myself? What if we end up homeless? And I hear this from lots of the the people who I've spoken with who have been in these exact situations. It seems like a very clear cut thing. Your child says, I'm being sexually abused or I'm being abused by someone. And the adult says, okay, we're going to pursue this. We're going to handle this. We're going to react to it. We're going to take care of you. We're going to protect you. And I would hope to get to the place where we have that being the more standard response than not. But people are people and they have their layers. They have their trauma. Again, I'm not excusing any of those behaviors because it's really terrible. It's really a problem. But I think something that surprises well, surprised me in my own healing, and I suppose when I'm working with my clients, is that you know part of healing from this trauma is beginning to understand your experience in the full context of everything that was happening. Again, not to excuse or to dismiss, but when we have, when we can pull out of our pain, and we can pull out of that moment of just being deeply within the trauma, where our life seems like that's all there is. As we learn and we heal and we grow and we get a broader and broader perspective about the experience, we do start to understand what was happening for that person. What were their fears? What were their traumas? What were their limitations? And I think when we reach that place, Gabe, we start to have a sense of empathy. And to my mind, that is one of the greatest healing factors of all because we get to step away from that situation and the victimhood of that situation and instead understand it in the full context of what it really was. I really appreciate you saying we start to understand the the full breadth of what's happening because I, you know, I, I live in the world, I live in America, you know, just like everybody else. And, and, you know, there, there's been a lot of large sexual scandals uh, childhood sexual scandals that have gone on for decades and involve, uh, you know, hundreds of families. And and the one thing that I see on the internet and I hear, you know, from the water cooler talk is, well, that would never happen to me. That would never happen to my child. Well, those parents must have been mm-hmm. awful. Mm-hmm. There's this knee jerk reaction that if you or your child are in that situation, you did something wrong. And to hear you talk about it, it's much, much different from that. You're not giving anybody a pass. You're not saying that, as you said, this this behavior is terrible, it's wrong, and we have to do better. But it it sounds like you understand the complexity of it in a way that could probably get us to solutions faster than just pointing the finger at people and saying, all these parents are terrible. Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly. And I think that's one of the reasons why having these conversations publicly and bringing this topic more and more to the forefront and starting to impact the way that we educate children in sex ed and in our homes and how do we educate our parents? I mean, my goodness, (laughs) the level of things that we do not teach people. I was a teacher, so I love teachers, but I often look at my own like, experience in teaching, like, man, like, this is only going to help you for like a day. What you really need to be learning and understanding is how to communicate and how to relate to people. And I think that a lot of the reactions that we see that are poor come down to unhealed trauma and a deep, deep lack of education and willingness to approach and talk about these topics. If you had parents being spoken to and talked to, like, here's what you do, here's how you respond, here are the resources, right? If you think about it, like, if your kid falls down and gets a scrape on their knee, you know what to do immediately, right? You pick them up, you cut them a little bit, you get the, you know, antibiotic, whatever it is, put it on, <laughs> put on a band aid. Yep. This, why do parents know how to do this without thinking about it? Why do they just react? Because we've had this modeled for generations, <laughs> right? 
this is how you take care of a scraped knee. What we have not had modeled for like only like a minuscule amount of time, there are people starting to try to do this work, is how to respond when your child comes to you with an emotional trauma, a sexual trauma. So if we can start to treat these sorts of experiences the same as like, oh, this is my child telling me he or she has a scraped knee. What is my protocol? What do I do? How do I respond? Then I think we can support our parents and also, of course, educating our children on how to speak up and use their voice too. One of the things that struck me as you were you know, giving that analogy is uh, you're using all the correct terminology. You said, my child scraped his knee. You didn't say, my child got a boo-boo on his bendy leg or mm-hmm. you know, a- a- anything like that. And uh, we understand how to sort of help children through emotional stuff. Like you said, you, you pick the child up and you, you maybe cuddle him for a minute, but not too long, not too long. It, there's all of these things that I think about, man, when we deal with sex, let's just talk about children mm-hmm. and sex. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't even use the correct terminology. It's, you, right. you know, it's it's your PP or your bottom or, you, you know, so if something did happen, one, we're already uncomfortable with a lot of emotional things. We're already uncomfortable with sexual trauma. And just at its core, we're uncomfortable discussing sex with children. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I can see how all of those things coming together would make it very, very difficult, you know, for the child to be able to talk about it correctly and be able to, you know, sort of move the needle with an adult. But an adult being able to ask questions back to find out if the child is incorrect, misinterpreting, or Again, I fell down and hurt my knee. Okay, how did you fall down? I fell off my skateboard. You know, there's Mm -hmm. follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. You know what to look for. Uh, You don't have to take the child's word for it. And that doesn't exist, uh, you know, in in this other arena. Mm. What's the solution for that? Aside of, I mean, I can think of a million solutions. You know, we we have to stop, you know, tiptoeing around sex with children. I I mean, I, I... I understand, but that, that that's a tall order. My my mother still cringes when I say penis or vagina to <laughs> right? children under Man. twelve, and I'm like, I'm like, mom, that's that's what they're called. Uh, and you know, she's old school. She prefers yeah. you know pee pee and hoo hoo. And I understand why she's uncomfortable, but but I I feel that there's a a real need for this kind of open dialogue in our society. But we're only a generation apart, right. so. That means at best one yeah. generation, and believe me, I have friends my age that are just like, why are you doing that? They think it's weird. It's such a tricky thing. I think there are so many components that add up to the discomfort that we have around sexuality. Uh, America in particular, the United States in particular is a fascinating society because we are the most sex phobic, yet the most sexualized. Right. So as long as it's like picture and image and these representations of these ideas of bodies and sex that we've come to decide are good and sexy and fun, all of that, then we lean in. But when it comes to the actual nitty gritty of the thing, (laughs) you know, it's like, ooh, hands off. I can't go there. I can't talk about it. And so you know, where does this come from? I mean, I'm not a, you know, historian, so I'd love to speak with somebody who maybe knows more than me, but just from my own kind of intuition and research and being in this field, thinking about, you know, if we trace it all the way back to where we start in this country and the way that sexuality was represented and utilized, if we go even further back than that and the way that women were traded and are still traded, you know, we've just got a very, 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 very long history of women's bodies being used as objects, as barter. And so we're fighting against that. And not to leave out male survivors because just because they don't have that history doesn't mean they don't get abused. They do. And so, you know, to have conversations about sex, to start being more on point about it, to to just be open I don't think it's going to be our generation, in other words. I think I don't even know if it's going to be the next. I think we're about three or four, fingers crossed, right? (laughs) Generations out from before we start to really challenge and start to see some shifts. I know some really wonderful people, colleagues of mine, who are doing great work with parents about how they're talking with their kids about sex and their bodies and these sorts of things. So, yes, we have discomfort in talking about sex, but ultimately, 
this is a conversation that when it gets down to the nitty gritty, when you put people in rooms together, they talk about sex all the time. Like my girlfriends and I will have deep, interesting, graphic conversations <laughs> about sex, <laughs> right? And so there's also this confusing illusion that it's uncomfortable, but it's comfortable. In certain spaces, it's all right. In other spaces, it's not. The parent-child dynamic, there's this tiptoeing around that doesn't happen when they're with their adult friends. So I don't have the answers, I guess is a long story short here, but just looking at some of the things that I've seen at play that I think are where we're making change and where we're starting to see some movement and some of the reasons why we're still very stuck. I appreciate you being so honest with your own life and your own history and your own trauma. I think that it's very brave to be open about it. And I also appreciate that you've put so much work and research and education behind it so that you can help others. That's very commendable. And and I, I applaud you for it. Thank you so much for moving in that direction. Thank you. Yeah, you know, there was this, uh, when I was 18 and I went off to college, I met a boy. And within, you know, maybe about six months of dating this boy, I was really clear that I, that this past trauma of mine was a problem <laughs> that I had not healed, that it was really impacting my ability to trust and my ability to communicate and my emotional regulation was all over the place. And with some prompting from him, I finally decided to start going to counseling and talk about what had happened. You know, in my work, one of the things we I talk about are the stages of healing. And in this moment of acknowledging, hey, my life isn't working, I've got to take a look at what happened. That moment of acknowledgement is a bridge from victimhood to survivor. And I lived into that and I started understanding and I started coming to realize why my life was the way it was and why I felt the way I felt. And in the midst of all of that, in this relationship ended up being a 10 year run that we were together. And along the way, he became a very abusive man and he drew out my abusive nature as well. And when that relationship ended, Gabe, I was in my new apartment. Life had just kind of been stripped down. I had a sleeping bag and a lamp. Uh, and I remember sitting, leaning up against the wall one day, and I was just crying and in fear and what's going to happen with my life. And I don't know anymore. And you have to think about it. From 18 to 28, I had been with this man. Yeah, it's a long time. Right? And... I'm thinking, God, I'm approaching 30, and I don't know what I'm doing with myself. And I just remember a really strong voice kind of interrupting all of that and just saying, Rachel, you have got to get your shit together like right now, right now. And I don't know why it was and how it was and what happened exactly in that moment, but that was the turning for me. And I just became obsessed. And I was like, I am going to figure this out. I am going to answer this question of how do I actually heal from sexual abuse? And that's really, Gabe, what launched me into reading and researching, studying neuroscience, doing my master's in counseling psychology, and honestly, just using myself as a guinea pig. I really didn't set out to do this as a career. <laughs> I really was just trying to get myself together. But as it began to unfold and as I started to see my life changing, I thought, well, if this can work for me, maybe there's a chance that it can work for others. And 12 years later, here I am. And that to me is the greatest gift is just when I really started to shift from just understanding the trauma to wanting to understand what to do about it and how to heal about it. That's what I call beyond surviving. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that. I We're almost out of time, but I have a, a real quick question for the sexual abuse recovery coach. If anybody who is listening is a survivor of abuse, you know, they're, they're relating to your story and they're understanding what you want to say and, and they want to reach where you have, uh, what are some of the first steps that they can take toward recovery? Mm. So first of all, my darling, beautiful people who are out there listening, who have experienced sexual trauma, this is not a life sentence. You're not destined to be hurt. You're not destined to spend every day dealing with the past and in pain. And the first thing that we can do is make a decision. 
we have to make a choice that we want something to change. And from that place of choice, we can then take action. And to my mind, the best first action is to understand exactly where you are in this healing process. From my website, you can go rachelgrantcoaching.com slash checklist. And you can get my guide that will talk more about the stages of recovery, victim, survivor, beyond survivor. And the important thing about that guide is it's going to give you a checklist to help you figure out where you are, but it's also going to tell you what the goals of each of those stages of recovery are and the types of support that align with that stage. So many survivors of abuse and trauma end up getting re-traumatized because they're trying to do goals that they're not ready for yet. They're trying to reach and achieve things that they're not, they haven't got the other foundations in place yet. And they're using healing modalities that don't address the correct stage of where they are. So that guide will help break all of that down. And from that place, you'll then be able to make better decisions and focus your energy on what you need to focus on to get to the next level and then to the next level. Thank you, Rachel, so much. Your book, Beyond Surviving the Final Stage in Recovery from Sexual Abuse, I'm sure you can get it on your website, but is it also available on on Amazon and other sites like that? It is definitely available on Amazon. Thank you so much, Rachel, for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time to, you know, sort of play in my sandbox. (laughs) You're welcome, Gabe. I appreciate you. And thank you for creating the space for me to share my story and um, to connect with your community. I really appreciate it. Well, we we certainly appreciate you. And listeners, please, if you can take a moment to go to wherever you downloaded this podcast and give us as many stars as possible, use your words and write us a nice review. Share us with your friends, share us on social media, email us, burn it onto a CD and give it to your grandma. We would really, really appreciate it. And remember, you can get one week of free, convenient, affordable, private online counseling anytime, anywhere, simply by visiting betterhelp.com slash psych center. We'll see everyone next week. You've been listening to the Psych Central podcast. Previous episodes can be found at psychcentral.com slash show or on your favorite podcast player. To learn more about our host, Gabe Howard, please visit his website at gabehoward.com. Psychcentral.com is the internet's oldest and largest independent mental health website run by mental health professionals. Overseen by Dr. John Grohall, psychcentral.com offers trusted resources and quizzes to help answer your questions about mental health, personality, psychotherapy, and more. Please visit us today at psychcentral.com. If you have feedback about the show, please email show at psychcentral.com. Thank you for listening, and please share widely.